So Sam has been an independent filmmaker uh, since 1980s. He directed 22 theatrical feature films. He did his studies here in L.A. at Loyola Marymount University. Uh, one film, particularly one more chance, starring Kirstie Alley, won prizes in major film festivals. And that began his career as a director. Then some commercial hits like American Ninja and the breakdance phenomenon, Breaking to Electric Boogaloo, 1984. Yeah. So Sam, you're from Poland originally, uh, grew up in Jerusalem, uh, in Israel, and then 72, you went to the United States. That's where Shmulek became Sam. And as we mentioned, you studied Loyola Marymount and you, you're married. What's your wife's name? I want to... Iris. So Sam, going to go ahead and tell me first about your yourself because you're a very good example of that period. How how did you get your foot in the Israeli in the American film business? And as, as we mentioned, you had a hand in launching Kirsi Ali's career. Tell me a little bit. <laughs> so as you mentioned, I was born in Poland, but I was already in Jerusalem when I was six months old. So I don't have any memories of Poland whatsoever. I don't speak Polish. I don't <laughs> anything. So I grew up in Jerusalem and uh, in a, a small neighborhood, Moshava Germanit, the German colony. And there, there was a theater and that's where I got my <laughs> cinema education in this theater uh, every afternoon, every once a week. Uh, but uh, so I, I set my mind of becoming involved in uh, movie business, but there was no movie business in Israel. And if there was some, it was in Tel Aviv. But it was a small, small industry. Uh, and in the beginning, after 48, after the independence of the state in 48, uh, a Hebrew-speaking movie would come out once every two years, once every three years, one movie. You mentioned uh, 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 Hill uh, 24 doesn't uh, no answer. I think it was the first Israeli movie. So it was a very primitive guerrilla movie making, but there were some Amer Amer big Hollywood movies came to Israel to produce, Exodus, uh, Cast the Giant Shadow. So those were the two uh, elements uh, of the Israeli primitive, primitive beginning Israeli cinema. And all the movies at that time, they were all, they were dealing with subjects of collectiveness. Everything is... It was either a military, we are building the country, we are, we are it was a group. It was not an individual cinema about, uh, about emotions, <laughs> nothing about love story or, or, or struggle. It was all collective struggle, collective achievement. Those, this was the cinema until the arrival of the, to the scene, on the scene of Menachem Golan, which we'll talk about him in a second because he is the subject of our... Uh, uh, this uh, discussion today, so I will tell you how he changed the cinema in Israel from this point on. Uh, then there was a long period of only uh, 76, 1960, 1970s, 1980s, that in Israel they produced only uh, comedies which were uh, popular comedies, very much like Turkish movies, like uh, Egyptian movies, like uh, the like. And they were all about, about uh, either conflict between rich and poor, uh, Ashkenazis and Svaladi, uh, central Israel versus the periphery. Until, and th th this died in the 2000s, around the 2000s, this type of movies, we, you call, we call them Burekas movies. <laughs> I don't know. And they died, and then came out the movie that you are talking about, the quality Israeli movies, which will you know, are going to uh, uh, Academy nominations, they're doing well in television. So this is the today uh, state of affair. No more commercial cinema in Israel because there are not enough audience, but rather quality, which is uh, subsidized by government, of course. And, but in the past, here and there, some quality movies came like Salah Shabbati emerged. So this is the state of the Israeli cinema uh, nowadays. Uh, I, uh, uh, your question, how I got involved. So I was not involved in the Israeli cinema whatsoever until I served my service in the army. And I knew that I want to be involved in cinema, but I love American cinema. I don't like European <laughs> cinema. I'm not crazy about, about quality, artistic cinema, let's say, uh, experimental, <coughs> sorry, experimental, uh, or any of those. I love, I always loved American cinema. 
So my goal was, as I finish my service, I'm going to Hollywood to study how to make movies, to become a movie maker. And um, I got involved uh, uh, mainly by meeting Menachem Golan, that we'll talk about him, by meeting him here in Hollywood. And he and his company, they gave me the first chance to get involved in cinema. I did uh, uh, several jobs, uh, mainly assistant director, until I got my first chance to direct. Uh, in, when I went to Loyola Marymount University here in Los Angeles. And this was the movie One More Chance with Kirstie Allen. And from there on, I was a director, legitimate film director in, in uh, uh, Hollywood, so-called American commercial uh, film director. I, I, I have to look on your, I found your website and there's a story there about how you got the money for the first film, took a student loans and then to finagle the film developer. <laughs> <laughs> on but but money. again, this, this ties to the Menachem Golan Yoram Globus story because I knew them. I started to work with them early on. I came here to Los Angeles in 1972 and started schooling here. Uh, there was a college, uh, Columbia College in La, on La Brea. And while I was going to school, I met Menachem Golan. And I knew about him. He was famous Israeli filmmaker, the most famous Israeli filmmaker. And he was producing here in Hollywood a movie, producing, directing with Tony Cortis. The name of the movie is Lepke, about Lepke Bohlzer, the Jewish gangster from New York, the notorious Jewish gangster from New York. And he gave me a chance to work on this movie. And I worked uh, for a long time, for five years as assistant director. And then I decided to come back to the US, uh, assistant director here in Israel, and I decided to come back to the U.S. to go to uh, undergraduate, uh, graduate degree, graduate studies. I went to Loyola Marymount. And while I was there, I, just, I already had so much experience, five years of assistant director, big movies, some Hollywood movies, Antebe, The, Ra the Raid of Antebe, the, some big, big movies. I was assistant director and I had experience and I decided I want to be a director. I want to tell stories. I don't want to be assistant or any other uh, other job in the movie making mechanism, but rather the one who tells the story. So I wrote a script when I was going to school. I wrote the script. I decided to produce and to direct a movie which was called One More Chance. And I decided in my mind during this time, two years or two and a half years that I'm going to film school, the university, I will uh, accomplish. Uh, a full feature, 90 minutes uh, movie. But of course, uh, didn't have money. I met with another friend, uh, Israeli friend who went to school. So he produced, I directed. And most of the money for our movie came from the financial aid office of the, <laughs> of the school. We convinced them we were lone students, lonely students. We didn't have parents in America. So they got <laughs> all kind of financial aid. And we use this money of the financial aid and partial job in, this, in the school, in the university. And we use this money to create, uh, to make this movie. But at some point we ran out of money. And by that time, uh, Menachem Golan and Yoram Globus had purchased the company Canon Film that I will tell you about. And we went to them to get the addition, the, uh, the rest of the money that we needed for another like 30 minutes to complete the movie. And they did. They gave us the money and they took the movie for distribution. And this was this was how it was financed. It took a year and a half to make this movie. But the, the, those are the, 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 the tries and tribulations of the young independent movie makers, generally. Right. How, to find the finances, how to make your first movie. How to... So once you get off the ground, then it goes from there. Yeah, if, if, you, if you can... Uh, prove that you are a director, that you can put a movie together and people start to believe in your ability, professional ability. So there are chances that you will get other jobs, other chances. Many directors direct their own project that they write. So they, they initiate product and a great deal of other directors are just working. They are directing movies that companies initiate. So many times, they are given a script and they go ahead, direct for us this mm -hmm. script that we like. Mm -hmm. So then you, you, so you, you got your start with Canon Globus, which is a combination of, what was it? Uh, Menachem Golan and Yoram uh, Globus. Globus. And so how did they start up? They so, started uh, back in Israel. 
So, uh, so this will lead us to, uh, this is leading us to our story that we want to tell about the Israeli invasion to Hollywood, but it started back in Israel. As you all know, traditionally, we all know that the, the, the uh, film industry in the West Coast uh, was so-called Hollywood, the Hollywood, was created by Jews. Uh, six out of the seven major studios were, were headed by Jews. Uh, the only exception was Disney, the seven. But, uh, you know, those names like uh, uh, Zucker, Sam Goldwyn, Lemley, Selzny, Lansky, Fox, Warner Brother. Uh, Louis B. Mayer, etc. So they created the, the industry here in the West Coast, the film industry. And, and, uh, and it was, you know, mostly people were American, but immediately right from the beginning, foreigners, let's call them foreigners, non-American citizens, they wanted to come and join because this was the major force of movie making in the world. So you had people come from Germany, mainly from England and Germany, Many of them were Jews, but not necessarily, you know, some of them, you know, and they invaded. But there were no, this was the European invasion, you know, people, European talent came here, but no Israelis. First of all, there was no Israel in the 30s, in the 40s, 90s, and, uh, and uh, only 48, uh, the state was uh, established. So as I mentioned before, in the beginning, there was those kind of, uh, very rare movies that happened in Hebrew. It was a big uh, uh, event. Every uh, Hebrew movie that came out during the 50s and the beginning of the 1960s. But then into the scene came a man uh, that had a completely different approach. His name was Menachem Golan. Menachem Golan was born in Tiberias in 1930. So during the independent war, he was 18 years old. So he served in the independent war. And after the war, he wanted to become a, a, a theater director. He went to London, if I'm not wrong, and studied theater, came back to Israel as a, as a theater director. And he directed mainly American uh, plays, uh, Tobacco Road. I was a kid, you know, that, that's, a, that's a very time down. I was young. So he started in, a, in a theater directing legitimate uh, uh, Hebrew theater in Israel, but he set his eye on movie making. He really decided that he wants to make movies, direct movies and not uh, theater. So he went to New York, studied some more. He worked with uh, Roger Corman here in uh, the US when he was in New York, came back to Israel. And he, he had a, 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 an American way of thinking about film that the, it's an, it's a, commercial enterprise making movies. It's not artistic only. It is storytelling, but it has to have the commercial values. You make a movie, you sell it, you make money. With this money, you make another movie. So his first movie uh, that he eventually put together was called El Dorado with Gila Almagol and Chaim Topol. They were young actors at the time. And this got him going, propelled. And from this point on, he did not stop. It was during the 60s, as I said, the, the, the years of the 60s and the, and the 70s, and the, the 70s. And, and he started with his company, he created a company, Noah Film, and he started to produce commercially based movies, movies that many people will come, buy tickets, put, that's before television in Israel. So this was the main entertainment. And those movies mainly were either adventures or comedies. Uh, ethnic comedies, comedies about uh, conflict, uh, social conflict, or some kind of military uh, adventures, uh, things like that. And, and it, it was working well. P uh, the audience, the Israeli audience liked it. At the time, there were about two, two and a half million people lived in Israel. Uh, you know, if you exclude some people, religion people, don't go to movies, Arab population will not come to Hebrew speaking movie. So uh, the rest was like one and a half million potential audience. And they came, they came, they bought ticket. There was money and he kept going, kept going and producing. A at some point he added to his company, his cousin and his then partner, Yoram Globus. Uh, also Menachem Golan, his original name was Menachem Globus. They are cousins, but he wanted a Hebrew name. So Golan, he was in Tiberias. <laughs> he was 
seeing the Golan Heights every day. So he adopted the name Golan. So they, together, they worked very well. Uh, Menachem Golan was in charge of the creative part of it. Globus, Yoram Globus, uh, that had more, he went to school more on the financial side. So he, he was in charge of the finances of the company. And they ran this company, Noah Film. And they, <coughs> sorry, and they started to produce not only Hebrew speaking movie, but kind of, kind of international movies, but produced in Israel. So they, they would bring like an Italian star or American star, whatever they could get together <coughs> and make movies that they can sell internationally. But they're very ambitious. Those two guys, they are very ambitious guys and they set their mind. So they started to go to France to Cannes Film Festival, sell movies, but they sent their eyes on, we want to go to Hollywood, to make movies in Hollywood, to make American movies. They had two big successes. This, they, the, the first big success was the musical Casablanca with Yoram Gaon. So they had this money. This was around seven, 1972, 1973. I was here, uh, just came as a young student. They took the money that they made from Casablanca. They came here to produce a Hollywood movie. I've mentioned Lepke with Tony Curtis. I just happened to meet Menachem Golani in a Hanukkah party. Somebody introduced us and he's, they told me he's working on this. They are producing this movie. And do I want to, to work? I, I, I expressed that I want to work with him. He accepted. I started to work on the movie. What a very basic job. And they have created here a company. The company was called Ameri Euro Picture. And they produced this movie. They had enough money to produce this uh, 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 gangster movie. It was after The Godfather. Gangster movies were very uh, fashion, in fashion. <laughs> But the Jewish angle was different. And with the same money, they produced another movie with Jack Palance, the producers, also gangster movie. I think they sold it to Warner Brothers. But the movie did not generate enough profit to move on. And, but they stayed here in Hollywood. They wanted to make another movie. Another uh, Hollywood movie was not very successful in the beginning, but eventually they got some, some kind of financial together. And... Uh, they produced a movie called Diamond with Robert Shaw and Shelley Winters, but they decided to shoot it in Israel, to film it in Israel. It was cheaper. Uh, I went with them. I, I was involved, assistant director in this movie, uh, Diamonds. Uh, they finished it. They came back. To, I Meantime, they were producing Israeli movies at the same time and selling, and they had a chain of theaters in Israel. So they have turned the, the movie industry into business. Before, it was an artistic endeavor. Now it was a business in Israel. They had a company with theaters and distribution. And so beside the usual influx of uh, American movie, of course, and Italian and French movies, there were Israeli movies coming out all the time. And because of them, not only them, because of this, other companies flourished and other production companies used the same formula ethnic uh, comedies, and, and so now there were few companies making it, and, and this was the business of the Israeli cinema, and, and, uh, but they still did not give up on this uh, idea, Menachem Golan and Yoram Globus, of going to Hollywood. They came here back again. They tried another movie. They couldn't make it. It just didn't make, didn't happen. Now, at some point, there was another success, a big movie that they made. It was uh, called uh, Operation Thunderbolt, the Antebe, the raid on Antebe, which made enough mobby, money for them to make another uh, few more American movies in Israel, shooting in Israel. But then they had a big hit, Lemon Pepsico, directed by Boaz Davidson. Boaz Davidson was at the time the top comical director of Israeli cinema. And every movie he made was very, very, very successful. But then he made for them. They produced and he directed a movie called Lemon Pesicle. This was a huge hit in Israel. I mean, every Israeli basically saw the movie. Uh, I, uh, you know, we are excluding, excluding the religious crowd and the Arab-speaking people, which they don't go and see Hebrew-speaking movies. But other than that, Every Israeli, unless they were little boys, <laughs> little boys and girls, they went to see this movie. It was a big success in Japan, in Germany, and they had a lot of money. This was 1979. 
about the end of the 1970s. And finally, they, they kind of made it financially. And with this money, they bought a little distribution company, film company that was based in New York. The name of the company was Canon Film. It was a distribution production company, a small company that made kind of exploitation, sexual exploitation movies, small movies, small movies. But they immediately, as they bought the company, but it was a public company traded in uh, Wall Street. They immediately took the company, moved it to Hollywood. And so it was 1980, the beginning of the 1980s, and they have achieved, achieved their dream to come to Hollywood. And now here they are in, in Hollywood with a company. At this kind of at this point, because we're talking about Israeli cinema, they kind of abandoned the Israeli branch of making movies, and they have decided uh, to, to concentrate doing it. This was the beginning of the decline of this type of movies that I told you, the 80s, by the end of the 90s, those kind of movies, the comedy, the popular comedy. Of course, television came into Israel, one channel, two channels, three channels, and this was the decline, this was the end. By the end of the 1990s, there was no more, uh, even before, no more this type of comedy, type of popular movies, and this was the end of it. And this, is, this was the Israeli chapter of Menachem Golan and Yoram Kovs. Then what, what happened to them, though? Okay, they... now they are in Hollywood. They are sitting here, and, and they don't really know the scene of Hollywood. Hollywood is a very established and oiled machine. In Hollywood, there are seven big studios, Warner Brothers, Universal, Fox, Disney, uh, and, and, uh, and independent companies. At the time, I, I don't remember all the names. The, and they, they work by some kind of rules. And, and this is the 1980s. And for those studios and, and the independence companies, they were looking at the, at the market, at their potential market, the American cinemas. They didn't care so much. Of course, movies sold overseas. You know, American movies are so, selling all over the world. But, but the studios were kind of... Uh, uh, entrenched into a formula that the money comes from theaters here in America, and then they sell it to television, you know, and they show it again. And the money from overseas is gravy, is, is uh, who knows? It's uh, more money. Menachem Golan and Yoram Globus were more in tune in the international market. And they decided they would produce a movies that would be first of all aimed to the international market, and then whatever money they make here, do, it's called domestic can, North America, Canada and uh, US, this is the gravy. So they changed a little bit the formula, the way they thought about it, the way they operate. And they started, this is 1980, they started <coughs> with few horror pictures. At the time in the 80s, you, everybody knows that uh, the fashion changes in waves, the type of movies <laughs> that are popular are changing in waves. At the time, <laughs> horror movies were very, after The Exorcist, horror movies were very much in, gangster movies were out, and, uh, and uh, they started with little few horror movies, two, one, two, three a year, and they had to cut, their formula worked, and, uh, and, uh, as, as time passed, it was a small company. So we're at the first year, second year, third year. Meantime, right there at that time, a new market has emerged. It was the home video market. And, uh, you know, there were rental, uh, uh, video rental cassette stores in every corner and every block. And this was an emerging market that the, the big major studio did not pay attention to. For them, it was like a small little episodic, I did. The, sm the small companies like Canon Film and other, they took a notice and they realized that there is a money there. They can make money from those selling the cassettes to those stores all over. So that's how Canon, Canon with those two guys, uh, and they had, I, I, we can say, chutzpah that was not part of the industry, the, the local Hollywood establishment. They forged ahead with ideas that were not common here at the time in the Hollywood industry. And they have invented something, I don't know, call it to invent it, something which was called pre-sale. 
they would make a poster, write few, they, uh, you know, idea. We'll make a nice poster for this idea. Maybe they have a name of an actor that already signed and the name of the actor will be on the poster. And they went out and sold it, pre-sell. They would say, they will tell to all their buyers around the world and the cassette buyer, here is, this is the movie we're going to make. And here is the star. And can you pre-buy it from us? Even just uh, maybe only commit to buy it. And then they had enough money to make the movie. So the movie was made after it was sold, which was the opposite of the formula that Hollywood was working in. Working, Hollywood was making a movie, then selling it. And here came Menachem Golan and Yoram Globus, and they put it, turned it on his head. First they sell the movie, then they make it. And this kind of formula worked for them. And they started with small, as I mentioned, few horror movies. Then they realized that they are much better in action movies, making action movies. And, and, and for some reason, with, with their uh, vision and uh, their chutzpah, as I say, they started to make more and more and more and more movies every year. Two movies a year, four movies a year, immediately eight movies a year. They reached a point, 81, 1982, 83, 84, that they were making 20 and at the height of the Canon film, they were making 40 movies a year. The company was making 40. This is an enormous amount of movies. And suddenly everybody had to take notice of them. They were not anymore this small marginal company. Suddenly among the independent, this is not studio. We are not talking major money. We're not talking studio that make major, major big movies. So among the independent, they became a force and everybody had to work with them. Actors wanted to work with them, directors wanted to work with them, and, uh, and it became a, a company with force. Again, uh, Joram Globus is the youngest of them. He was in charge of the finances, and Menachem Golan was in charge of the creative part of it. The company was basically run by two of them, despite the fact that it was a, a, a public company which came back and bite them later and uh, at the same time they also uh, and, and they were at that point they became very ambitious so we are now talking 1985 1986 87 they became very very ambitious they start to believe that they conquered the world that's it nothing can stop them they started to buy uh, let's say they bought a big cha theater chain in england they they built a film studio in israel to they bought a lot of theaters in Israel because apparently there was money and banks were lending. They took lo loans from banks. And this Canon company became a big major player in the independent movie industry in America and Europe and around the world. And uh, um, But what happened, misma financial mismanagement. It became so big, so many movies a year, producing so many movies a year, and juggling so many loans and other financial means, theaters, uh, maintaining theater. At some point, they also created their own distribution company in locally, in, in what's called domestic, America, North America, because prior to this, they would uh, uh, distribute through MGM, but then, they became more ambitious. They said, we don't need MGM anymore. We'll create our own distribution company, Canon Film and Canon Video and Canon Television. They were very, very ambitious with big vision. But uh, maybe they, uh, as it, it grew and grew and grew and expanded, maybe they were not built. They were built for a small operation. But once you're a big operation, big financial operation, maybe it takes, I'm mean, not a financial <laughs> men understand, but it takes more, probably more people who understand financing. And, the misman and then the financials started to collapse among them. They had more loans than income, more debt than income, more than the income. Uh, they started the problem with the IRS, the American IRS, with the FCC. They, they started, suddenly the, the troubles were collapsing, were coming down, avalanche of troubles. And it ended up that the company went to bankruptcy. This big, they started, they, they, there were so much banks after them and creditors and loans. 
So this company that at the, at, to that point created about 400 movies, which is a lot. And some of them were artistic movies, not all of them. I, there was a formula of commercial, making commercial movies, but some of them gave chances to some artistic, to John Casabetes to make a movie. There were, <coughs> sorry, in the Hollywood establishment, no matter how big a director or famous director and actor is, if they don't make money, the studios will push them aside, will reject them. So uh, Canon collected all those rejects. As I mentioned, John Cassavetes, his movies didn't make money. So they adapted him, he came aboard. Chuck Norris and Charles Bronson, they were not any more studio stars. Canon adapted them. Canon started, they became exclusive with the Canon. Faye Dunaway made a movie with the, more than one movie with Canon. So other stars who were kind of outside the main system, they were not uh, uh, main big stars uh, in Hollywood, started or have been started to work with Canon. Now, not only this, beside the problem that they had financially, they, had, they were entangled in problem with the Hollywood establishment. Really, really bad. The Hollywood establishment is a machine that is uh, very entrenched, very, uh, as I say, well-oiled machine that works for many, many years. They know how to make money. Warner, Universal, Fox, MGM. Uh, it's known that the head of those studios, the seven studios, used to have a breakfast once a month uh, at the beginning of the month. And they... They coordinate what they are doing. They are competitors, but they are coordinate. There is a system in Hollywood. And that's how they keep everything in check. Uh, they know how to make money. And Canon was trying to break in with all kinds of unorthodox methods. You know, let's say uh, Hollywood is used to big, lavish parties, big uh, opening of uh, uh, movies, this takes a lot of money, but it's part of the business. Canon didn't want to do it. No big parties, no lavish lunches and uh, dinners, uh, no big uh, contribution events, which is part of the studio system. That's how they work. And the heads of the studios and the heads of whoever runs Hollywood, the big agents, the big agencies, the big lawyers, you know, the elite of this business, they started to see this is a troublemaking people. The biggest problem was, came to them, the studios control the salaries of the stars, the salaries of everybody. Because we have unions, like myself, director. So the industry controls the salary and also the star. At the time, this was 19, let's say 85, 1985, the biggest paid star, the biggest paid star in Hollywood would be paid $6 million per movie. Let's say Dustin Hoffman at the time, let's say, for example. Meryl Streep. Nobody was being paid more than six million. This was the top. This was the limit. Menachem Golan wanted to make a movie with Sylvester Stallone. And he had a script that Sylvester Stallone read and he said, eh. but the agent said to Menachem Golan, why would Stallone work with you? He works for the studios. You know, they pay him six million per movie. So Menachem Golan told him, I will double. I will pay him 12 million. So the agents went to Sylvester Stallone and some crazy guy wants to pay you 12 million. Why not? I'll make the movie. The movie is called Over the Top. This act pissed off Hollywood very much because they broke the ceiling. Now every star in Hollywood in the studio system say, I'm not working for 6 million anymore. Stallone, which is not a major, major star, got 12. <laughs> I'm a major star. Why don't why? So this, they pissed off Hollywood. So they, the relationship between Canon, those two Israelis, those two guys who came from Tiberias to the big city were no good anymore. Hollywood will not help them anymore. Rather puts, you know, sticks in the wheels. Uh, and, and those two elements together, the financial, the bad relationship with Hollywood, caused the, the collapse of Canon Film, which at some point was a very big, they have their own building in, uh, on Wilshire Boulevard, uh, big, big building with studio, with big theater, mixing, uh, mixing stages, editing room, financial. 
And uh, this was the end. This was the demise of the company. Now, at the same time, because of this, the relationship between the cousins, they, they were like those two cousins, those two partners, Menachem Golan and Yoram Globus, were like a married couple. They did not do anything without each other. They Everything they did with each other, but because of whatever happened, the, the, the stress, the financial, the split, they split. And they didn't. They split. Canon disappeared. They split. So they did not create a new company. They had, uh, they had uh, <laughs> communal businesses in Israel, theaters and a studio <coughs> near Jerusalem. So near Jerusalem, but they split also the, the assets in Israel. And for a few years, they didn't even speak to each other, but they didn't work. Uh, but each of them tried to create his, <coughs> his own follow-up company in Hollywood. Uh, Menachem Golan created another company, which was 21st century. <laughs> 21st century, uh, uh, Globus created the company Global Film, which was kind of canon number two. But both of those companies did not succeed. So they inherited some money out of the settlement of the bankruptcy. Every one of them had some money, but both of those en endeavors did not succeed. And they collapsed, and this was the end of the story of canon. Uh, Menachem Golan went back to Israel. Uh, Menachem Golan was a character, quite a character, very, very, very colorful character. He knew how to talk with the reporters. He knew how to hype himself. And uh, he was a very enthusiastic movie maker. When he directed, you know, nothing stood in his way. When he produced the movie, he was like a bulldozer. And this was his nickname in Israel, Menachem the Bulldozer. This was his nickname in Israel. So after Canon, he went back to Israel and he, he tried... He tried to keep making movies, raising money to make movies, went back to theater, uh, produced musicals, but and none of them, nothing really happened to him in the terms of, wow, one big success that will, will, uh, that will bring him back to the top. It did not happen. And uh, his health condition deteriorated. He died three, three or four years ago. One big Nice thing that happened to Menachem Golan, he got the prize of Israel. Israel gives prizes every year and uh, Yom Ma'ut for achievement in different fields, in science, uh, in, uh, uh, among them in, uh, in uh, uh, entertainment. And he got his recognition and he's called, now today he's knows, even when he's alive, he was the father of the Israeli cinema. This was his uh, title, like, father of the Israeli Abba Shela. Kolnoa Israeli, the father of Israeli cinema, and he got re a national recognition with Plus Israel, the prize of Israel. So this was nice to, to, to finish his career, but he didn't give up. He always believed that he would do more and more, but he, he died not long ago. Yoram Globus kind of moved to real estate business. He, he shrewd businessman, so he's a rich man. He's still alive. He, he's a rich businessman. Mainly, uh, he kept all the theaters, GG theaters, all across Israel, and all kind of real estate. That he's in the real estate business, and he's probably doing well. Yeah. And that's the end of this uh, uh, glorious story. It was uh, like a dream. Uh, something, two Israelis came in, invaded, this, created this huge balloon, balloon that puffed, and they parachuted down. That's fascinating. Rise and fall of Kenan. Yeah. You know, some of it is like what happened with the early studio founders when they came in, blew up what was the pre-existing Edison model of little five-minute videos, blew it up, uh, but they didn't have a strong studio system against them. They created the strong studio system. So, But I think also now the studio system is sort of gone. It's, they maybe were ahead of their time. Now you've got all these streaming outlets, streaming companies, all of them competing one against the other. Um, film uh, sitting in a theater seems to be going down the tubes. Um, yeah, but the, those corporations that you're talking about, the, the big corporations, they're not anymore the, the studios that the Zucker and Meyer right. created. They are run by, they, first of all, they are run by Wall Street people, by financial people, by yeah. professional managers, not by movie people. And they are conglomerates, you know, Universal purchased ABC, CBS purchased Paramount. Those are big, big, huge companies. And they have 
strong financial background. They have libraries and theme park and merchandising and television station. So from, you're right about the movie business, the so-called movie business, the theat- theatrical movie business is changing. Something is changing. It's happening right now, even as, you know, in our lifetime. But the corporation, they will not fall yet, except uh, the last change was that MGM was purchased by Amazon. Amazon took over MGM. MGM. Yeah. Uh, so, but, but it happens all the time right nowadays. Sony bought uh, uh, Columbia. Columbia became Sony. But those are big, big corporations. They knew how to manage the financial side of it. <laughs> Menachem Golan in Europe know, didn't want to give in, didn't want to bring in a financial advisor, financial wizard, CEO, nothing. They knew everything. They knew everything. They believed in the market. I said market system, like oriental market system. They, they thought that they are in the market in Istanbul, ah, okay. <laughs> running Bizarre. a company. Everything was haggled, negotiated. Mm-hmm. Not like, you know, a serious CEO with a background, financial background from uh, Wall Street, etc. Et that's <laughs> interesting. Uh, so that's what happened. To this company it was a little bit more complicated i don't we don't need to go into detail they brought in a partner and turned out the partner was a mafia guy from uh, uh, italy paletti and uh, and it, it's more complicated the demise of the company is more complicated but we don't need to go into the, the detail yeah. because the israeli invasion part of it i, I basically yeah. i told yeah so i, I th- th- it's fascinating fascinating because this gives us an insight into how it, it's how films are made, uh, what goes into it. It's like when you say, how is a sausage you make made? You like the sausage, but if you know how it's made, you don't like it. <laughs> something of that. I, there are th- two other figures. So the other character was, we want to talk about, or not character, I don't want to use that term, uh, figure is uh, Haim Saban, who is one of the big players at the New Academy Museum of Motion Pictures because he planted a lot of the seed money there. And I just... Remember him because when my kids were growing up, say, age of six, seven, they were hooked on Power Rangers. I know there was this Israeli guy who had gone to Japan and brought the rights to the movie, uh, to this TV series, and turned it into an American series, dubbed it into English, and that was it. So now he's a big man in many ways, and not just in Hollywood, also in the Democratic Party. So tell me about time. So Chaim Saban is an interesting story. He was actually born in Cairo came to Israel as a kid, immigrant, as a, as a kid, eight or seven years old, old and uh, with a musical talent, so he, and, <laughs> and apparently also organizing talent. So he had a, a band in the 1960s. He was playing, and he was the manager of a rock band in Israel. And this was strange music in Israel at the 60s. Nobody played rock and roll, American music. The, most of the group troops played this Israeli music, French, French influence, uh, Italian influence. And, uh, and the people who made movies which were influenced by American uh, music were strange. But anyway, he had a band uh, and, and he was the manager of the band. And uh, apparently his aspirations were bigger than just a little band in Israel in uh, rock and roll. So in, ni- in the 70s, 1970s, he moved to France. And uh, with the same thing, he took with him a few Israeli artists, uh, Mike Brandt, uh, that were successful in, in, uh, in France. And he became the manager, he became a musical manager uh, with the uh, uh, knowledge. He, he is a musician himself. Uh, 1980, actually 1983, so remember, Canon was already here. Menachem Golan and Yoram Globus started Canon in 1980. This is 1983. He moved from... Uh, uh, France to Hollywood, together with his partner, Shuki Levy. And both of them were musicians, and they were already in the business of scoring children programming for television. Maybe they, they started in France, and they started to do it here. So whoever need to score uh, cartoons for children, um, children programming, they came to them, and they, uh, um, uh, Saban and Levy, uh, Chaim Saban and Shuki Levy, <laughs> <coughs> Sorry, <laughs> gave them good deals and composed the music, produced the music, and gave them back the music. At some point, uh, he is a, a apparently very, very talented businessman, Chaim Saban, very talented businessman. He realized, why do, should I make the, only the music? I, 
let me also start to produce uh, uh, children programming. And he started small together with his uh, partner, Shuki Levy. At some point, they separated. I don't know what point, it doesn't, that matter. Uh, and uh, uh, Chaim Saban had started to produce his own te- te- children programming with the music, putting the music and selling it to the companies who, uh, the television stations who distribute this kind of, who needed this kind of programming, mainly Fox. I think his main relationship was with Fox television. And uh, he's probably, as I said, business shrewd in the business and, and good vision, good, good sense of what, what, just like Menachem Golan also had this sense of what will work with audience. So he encountered one time this Japanese program which, which called the Power Ranger. It's some kind of, uh, for children, with a, a, a robot that morphs into fighter, fighter morph into robots, something that the children liked very much. But it was Japanese and it was a little bit strange. He purchased the right to this program in Japan, brought it here, and every episode they added a little bit more an American they, they shot here, you know, they filmed here in Hollywood for every episode, a couple of minutes. They uh, edited together the, the Japanese material with the material that they did here in English, and he sold it. This became a tremendous hit. This was, uh, I believe it, it was uh, kind of in the 80s. Uh, uh, I wrote it here. He, uh, uh, he founded his own company at the time, Saban Entertainment, uh, and uh, it was the 1990s. The Saban company became known for producing the Power Ranger. It was called the Power Ranger. And uh, his company now, Saban Entertainment, was concentrating in this Power Ranger. Power Ranger was a big hit, huge hit. Merch- not only in television show, merchandising, live shows, music, because he's in all these businesses and he understands, he understands business. And, and it became big. Big, 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 bringing it a lot of money. And it went on, like I think, for like 10 years, uh, uh, seasons. Uh, uh, and uh, because he was in relationship with Fox, at some point in the 1990s, the, the uh, Saban Entertainment merged together with Fox Kid. There was a channel which was called Fox a Kid or Fox Children. Uh, and they created a, a worldwide uh, company uh, that distributes and uh, worldwide material for children all over the world. Of course, the, the power that they were riding on this Power Ranger, this was the base. But it, it became a, a company together. Uh, and uh, the name of the company was Fox Children Network uh, uh, or Fox Kid Worldwide. Uh, this company was working very well, but in 2001, as I said, Saban turned out to be a financial genius. In 2001, they sold this company, this merged company of Saban and Fox, to Disney for $5.3 billion in cash. This was a deal that was never done before in television business. Paying in cash, giving cash, Cash, $5.3 billion. Out of this, because it was some partnership, Saban himself, he took from this deal $1.6 billion. So somebody who had nothing suddenly had in cash $1.6 billion. Uh, From this on, from this point on, he really took off. He bought and sold television stations uh, here and in Israel. Uh, Univision, the the Spanish-speaking you know, he bought it for so much money, sold it for double. In Israel, he bought one of the Israeli channels, sold it for double. So his cash money was growing, growing, growing. Uh, today, he's estimated, you know, in, in the financial newspapers, he's estimated that he, uh, he, he is worth $2.8 billion. He's in the list of the richest people of America. Uh, but as you mentioned, there he branched. It's not, he's not only in, uh, in uh, the movie business. And the main thing is that he penetrated politics. And he's a major, major donor to the uh, uh, Democratic Party. He's a good friend with the Clintons. 
he he financed the Hillary, basically financed the Hillary Clinton campaign. Uh, so he's uh, very tight with the Democratic Party, and uh, with the <coughs> uh, he also plays a role in the Israeli politics. He's now he's still doing business nowadays. Very rich man. Uh, probably doing uh, other businesses in the communication area, buying and selling companies. And uh, he's very big also with his wife in philanthropy, especially kids' hospitals. They, they for some reason, they adapted this field. Uh, he's uh, their favorite uh, area of philo- philo- philanthropy is uh, children's hospitals here in Los Angeles or in America, in Israel. So that's the story of Chaim Saban that grew up from a rock band to become one of the richest people in America. Very good, very good, very good. So you can, with the right vision, the right mind, you can make it. And if you're careful, you don't go bankrupt in the process. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) to be savvy and and conservative. And apparently he was conservative, savvy. Solid, solid. And he knew what he was doing in Mm. business without going to business school, but a natural, natural sense, natural... uh, uh, instincts for this business, right. for yeah. money business. Yeah, the, and, uh, business schools do not train entrepreneurs. They no. train managers. Yeah, yeah. They train <laughs> I guess. entrepreneurs. I know this from no, some people are uh, in business. And, uh, and he was good also in entertainment to seize the opportunity. Right. Oh, it was Menachem Golan. When Menachem Golan saw breakdance, nobody believed in breakdance. Menachem said, let's make movies about breakdance. Boom. Uh, uh, Chuck Norris was out. Menachem Golan said, let's, let's get Chuck Norris and we'll resurrect his uh, career. They did, yeah. and, uh, which became his television show, his big television show. Yeah. So, so it was uh, probably Chaim Saban. So I'm going to go here to another figure in the film industry, who's sort of a mystery man. Uh, and he's the producer of two Oscar-winning films and other very successful films that also support supposedly a secret agent, and that is <laughs> Arnold Milken. Uh, Arnold Milken is the most, uh, I would say, colorful. His story is the most interesting for all the, all the three of them, uh, out of the three of them. Menachem Golan was bigger than life, man, bigger than life. Uh, Milchan is not the same type, he's reserved, but very, his story is a very colorful story, and, and uh, here is his story. He was born, he, he was born in Israel, uh, before they independent, in Lachobot, and uh, his father already owned a very successful big fertilizing company, uh, because Lachobot is the center of agriculture area uh, company. Uh, uh, they sent him, so he was like a a kid of elite, of a rich family. Back then, before 48 or right after 48, they sent him to schooling in England to to become an English tutor, you know, one of those high schools in England. So he already was international when most of Israelis were very local, very provincial. Uh, So Arnon was already in England, boarding school, different different breed. But his uh, father died very early, they called him in and he had to inherit. He had to. Anyway, he inherited this company. He found out that the company was on the verge of bankruptcy, actually. It was not well management. But uh, like the other two that we mentioned, he's probably very talented financially. He took this company and he turned it into a big, huge chemical and fertilizing conglomerate, not only, not only in Israel. He moved the headquarter to Paris. And he made it into one of the most major, biggest fertilizing companies uh, in the world. The, the, uh, it's called the Milchen Brothers. He has an uncle. Uh, together. So he, he, he's talented. Usually people inherited business and they, <laughs> they take it down. He inherited business and flourished. He made it into big business. According to rumors and what, I, uh, and what we hear, not only the company is huge, really huge dealing with chemicals now not only uh, fertilizing because even when you uh, you produce weapon you need chemicals for the uh, powder and he had his own uh, uh, fleet of of uh, cargo cars uh, a cargo uh, ship to move the chemicals in th- through the world but but he's not a very uh, 
he's kind of quiet man. He does, he's not the one who will go out on newspapers and interviews and tell everybody his business. So people don't really know exactly uh, how it operates. But that, 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 those are the rumors or the facts that not only he owns this huge uh, uh, chemical company, but also a fleet, big fleet of uh, aeroplane, ship, whatever you need to, to ship material around the world. And this, this fact brings us to the next phase uh, of, his, of his life, of his career. He also, by the way, he also earned a degree in a London School of Economics. So he's also, he, he's educated in economics. Uh, uh, here comes to the picture Shimon Peres. Shimon Peres was probably a friend of his father, a friend of the family. He, not totally strange. But Shimon Peres was entrusted at this point, this is in the 50s, by Ben Gurion. Ben Gurion uh, picked up Shimon Peres to create the nuclear program for Israel. Ben Gurion was afraid that something will happen to Israel. He needed some, something uh, existential uh, uh, weapon. And he decided to build the atomic bomb. And Shimon Peres was the architect of the Israeli secret nuclear weapon program. So uh, uh, he approached uh, Arnon, young Arnon Milchen, which already has a lot of business around the world, and he recruited him to a, a secret Israeli organization, which is called Lekem. This Lekem organization is a secret Israeli intelligent organization responsible to obtaining technology and material for the Israeli nuclear program and other highly secretive program. So Israel created this uh, agency, but Israel needed private citizen. You know, people will not sell to, uh, you have to start from zero nuclear program. I don't know what you need, material, blueprints, uh, you have to build a atomic uh, plant. So you need a lot of things that Israel didn't have none of it. And at the time, of course, not every country, every company will sell to Israel. So they, they had a network of private business. Arnold Milchen was not the only one. We are talking about him. There are others, well-to-do business or Jewish businessmen around the world who were recruited into this organization like Milchen. His activity included buying component to build, the, to build and maintain them and maintain the Israeli nuclear arsenal and supervising government back accounts and front company that finance the special needs of the entity of Israel intelligence operation outside the country. So he became, as a civilian, he became part of the network of Israelis who are working outside the country, either to purchase material, to oversee some espionage, uh, activity. So I will not say, many people say he was a spy. I will not say he was a spy in, a, in the way that we define spy that goes in. And, but he was overseeing uh, operation as a civilian for a secretive military uh, organization. Not, known, not a lot is known about him, about this operation. But lately, more and more is coming out. But he purchased for as a front company, he purchased for the state of Israel uh, most of the elements that, uh, what, that, uh, be, that were needed to build the nuclear program. And furthermore, I don't know, Israel has also at one point had a, a, its own uh, airplane, uh, 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 the Lavi. Uh, so components were st stalled from the Mirage, from the uh, uh, French Mirage. Israeli built tanks that from pro, from plans that they stole is based on the Abraham tank. So I, I, we don't know all the details, but it's definitely it's known that he was part of this operation and he was successful. Now, those people who are kind of merchants go between people between state and companies. They get commission, not from the state, not from the buyer, but from the seller. And we are talking about millions and millions of dollars, you know, those kind of components, 100 million, 300 million. So he emphasized, he, he always emphasized, from the state, he said, I didn't take one penny from Israel. But of course, I was well compensated, commissioned by the sellers, by the companies. So either uranium from South Africa, 
machines from any other countries in the world. So not only he was already very rich because of his chemical company, he became, he accumulated more and more and more uh, wealth from those commissions from the companies. And we are talking a lot of millions of dollars, big, 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 big money. And uh, he was good at it. So he kept at it to a certain point. We don't think that today he's still doing this thing. Now, Milchen, as we learned from his biography, as a, even as a kid, he loved movies. So he was crazy about movies. And as I read, he has a insomnia. <laughs> insomnia. He doesn't sleep very well. He sleeps two to three hours a day. So at the night, late night, when there is no work, he watches movies. That's what he does. He can watch five movies a day. And uh, he loves it. He always loves cinema. And uh, he became... Now he was a rich man, very rich man, very well to do. He needed uh, some hobby, something, something. And movies was probably what he set his mind to. So it was already in the 1970s. He got involved in the business of the movies. His first involvement was actually in an Israeli movie. He invested in an Israeli movie with the director, Abi Nesher. And from there on, he flourished. He moved immediately to Hollywood. And he realized, which is very easy to do when you have a lot of money, if you want to penetrate, you want to come in and you're from the outside, you need friends, influential friends. So the first people, one of the early people he made his friend was Robert De Niro and other, Sergio Leone and uh, many more big names in Hollywood. He had all the money in the world to spend on them, to invite them to come to Paris for lunch, fly them back, fly them forth. Money was not an issue for him to penetrate into this because the Hollywood, the, the, the truth is this, the Hollywood establishment, whoever is in, is in. It's very hard to penetrate. To penetrate, I don't know how it is today, but we are talking about the uh, 1990s, 1980s, when, when the, the, the business was tight. So they would not let anyone in unless it was a tremendous talent that you cannot uh, uh, ignore, Steven Spielberg. So they... Embrace him. Okay, Steven Spielberg, come in to the, to the club. You're part of the club. Or you have tremendous money. And that's the way. So Armand Milton penetrated the establishment, the, the elite group with his money. So he started to buy friends, Robert De Niro, head of studios, big agents, etc. And he started to produce movies. He created his own production company, uh, Regency. Uh, it's called or New Regency uh, uh, Pictures. New Regency Production, that's the name of his company. And he, pro- he created it in 1990, in the beginning of the 1990s. And he started with small movies here and there, but suddenly one of the movies that he produced, they were all independent small movie, made it big. It was the movie Pretty Woman, 1990. Pretty Woman with the, uh, uh, what's her name, Robert. And uh, uh, this was a big hit, huge hit. And suddenly now the studio say, oh, Okay, this, who is this man? Now they have to pay notice to him. Not only he comes in with big money, he also makes big hit. He makes, and he's friend with all the stars, etc., etc. So from this point on, he produced movie in this company. That's, that's his, I don't want to say hobby because he doesn't take it as a hobby. It's professional, but he, that's his playing grind. He didn't give up the chemical <laughs> companies. He's still, he's still a tycoon of, the, of uh, chemistry around the world, but this is his playing ground. He produced, since 1990, about 130 films. He, of course, he is conservative. This is not Menachem Golan with his craziness. He's a very conservative businessman with strong backing in, in his back. Uh, the studios love him. They give him money. Banks love him, etc. So he worked there. And uh, lately, in the, last few, in the last few years, among his uh, 130 movies, in the, lately he produced two Oscar-winning movies, 12 Years Slave and Birdman, 19, uh, 2014 and 2015. Okay, so this is the positive side. <laughs> I'm painting the positive paint of Arnold Milchen's story, but there is lately some negative painting on his character. In nine, in 2018, the Israeli police recommended that Arnold Milchen, along with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, be charged with bribery. 
So Arnold Milchen, since the beginning, despite the fact that he's kind of center left, but he always loved to be involved in the Israeli politics, to influence, to, to, to be friend with top, uh, top ministers, top, uh, so that, that's, that's how he had enough money and he, he comes from an elite family as a child. So he saw it as his right to be involved in Israeli uh, uh, politics. Either they are uh, the, the left, people from the left of the right. So he became friendly with uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and his wife, Sarah Netanyahu. They became friends. And uh, it was uh, known that uh, Netanyahu likes cigars, expensive cigars, and his wife likes expensive champagne. So Arnon Milchen, according to the indictment, let's say, allegedly, according to the indictment, was the supplier of champagne and cigars for the uh, Netanyahu's. And it sounds innocent so far. We are talking about million dollar, a cumulatively million dollar of champagne and cigars. But it was not so innocent. Milchen is Israeli. And there are some laws for Olim Hadashim, new immigrants, and they get some benefit tax exemption. At some point, if I'm right, Milchen decided that he's going back to Israel, but he wants those benefits, but he's not entitled. He is an Israeli, he's not a new immigrant. So they devised a law that if rich, very rich people are returning to Israel, for the first 10 years, they're exempt of taxes. This law passed through the Knesset and it's nicknamed the Milchen Law. It's known as the Milchen Law. Now, the police and whoever are telling, uh, are claiming that this is... Uh, uh, Corruption, this is not a legal straight law, according to police. Uh, as I said, the gift, uh, one million, about one million shekel. And that's where it stays today. Maybe it will not end up in the court. The procedure, now Netanyahu is not prime minister, so the procedures of, the, of this case are moving in the Supreme Court in Israel. Uh, the latest I heard that Milchen didn't want to come and uh, testify, things like this. There is a lot of gossip around this case. In any case, just to conclude it, Milchen himself, Arnold Milchen, I told you that Saban is estimated to worth 2.3 bil billion. Milchen is estimated to be worth 5.1 billion dollars. He's one of the richest people in the world <laughs> nowadays. Definitely the richest Israeli. Given, given that kind of wealth, uh, the bottle of champagne and the cigar is not... <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> no nothing. It's, I uh, think case 1000 yeah. is probably going to get thrown out. At least the other cases are bigger, like the submarine case and the... Yeah, but that's not, uh, that's not Milchen. Is not that's now. different. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's the submarine case. case. Uh, there is case 2000, case 3000, case right. 4000, but yeah. that's nothing to Those do with... All, all this one sounds uh, like a joke case. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm not going to get into Israeli politics or on that. No, Is we don't there... know yet. We have to wait to yeah, see. Because there, the there have actually been real economic benefits to Israel to allow wealthy figures to come in and establish an Israeli economy, but many, like oligarchs. It's right? exactly, many people say, don't pick on him. He did so much for Israel, let alone this champagne and cigar, never mind. <laughs> and even this little bit questionable law, which is called the Milchen law, yeah. because this guy did so much for Israel for free, it didn't take one penny. Right. That, uh, I mean, not from the state, he made a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but let it go, never mind. He, so it's very interesting, enough. you know, I see so, you, you, you outlined for us three very different types that got into the film industry. The, uh, the creative, imaginative, break all barriers type, whether it goes well or not, the one who comes from without, without any money, you know, he's a kid coming from here to Israel as an Egyptian immigrant, there's no money there behind him, right? That's, it's all on his own. He gets it, builds up. And then someone like Milton, who takes a family wealth, but it builds something big with it. Interesting. Three very different approaches and all involved in one way or the other in the film industry. And the Israeli, the Israeli sake of Hollywood. I, I, I want to thank you so very much for this time.